Okay, very good questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, well, <coughs> there's uh, a, a number of strands to your question. Uh, first of all, we're starting off from here. We're in the situation that we're in today. Uh, it's a situation that could have been greatly ameliorated and better decisions have been taken by all sorts of people. Um, uh, but, but we can't get into the Irish story about what's the best way to go to Dublin and the fellow says, well, I wouldn't start from here. We're, we're starting from here. Now, let me tell you what here is. Uh, and there, there are two strands in your question. Here is, first of all, uh, a country that is borrowing 400 million quid per week to pay the ordinary running expenses of government. The government budget deficit doesn't include one penny of the bank bailout. So the 20 billion a year deficit is the gap between business as usual government expenditure and business as usual government revenue. Uh, whatever money has been shoved into the banks is actually come out of the National Pension Reserve Fund to date, right? Uh, there's a myth around that the government is trying to balance the budget and they're cutting this, that, and the other in order to create money to give to the banks. That's, that's been put around by folks that haven't read the figures, right? Second, uh, on top of that mess, uh, and it's a huge mess, we're borrowing at a rate that's unsustainable. If people think we can fire ahead and do that, then try and see what happens. And what happens is the government's checks will eventually bounce. That's what will happen. Uh, on the banks, on the 30th of September last, rightly or wrongly, the government guaranteed the deposits in the banking system. Principally, most of the liabilities of a banking system are deposits, which means your deposit and money. Uh, and the government decided to guarantee them. Uh, that, that, that cost a pretty big die. Uh, they also guaranteed some but not all of the bonds that have been issued by the banks. Now, the consequences of that since then uh, have become more serious because it has now emerged that the Irish banks were not merely illiquid, but in all, in all likelihood insolvent. In other words, they blew their capital uh, cushion by making dud loans mainly, or loans of more <coughs> the bank. Uh, now, the government has to have some form of bank rescue. Uh, Dan made three points about the NAMA bill, and I agree with all three of them. He said he has concerns about risk sharing, he has concerns about transparency, and he has concerns about corporate governance. The draft bill, and it was a draft, that the government uh, put out, I found bits in, I've read through it in detail, especially section 58, which is about valuation, that I didn't like, and Dan hit the, the three principal concerns one, two, three, then. those are, are, are my three concerns. Now, there's no point people being angry and saying, I'm not saying the questioner is, oh, we didn't cause this, and this was all caused by a share of politicians and bankers and developers and so forth, and they should pay for the crisis. It doesn't work like that. The developers are all bust, and they're not getting paid out. The, the risk with NAMA is that the bank shareholders <coughs> will get more than they should. If there's no developer getting relieved of one penny a debt. I don't know where that one got legs. Uh, the developers are all bust anyway. And of course, the banks are insolvent, or nearly insolvent. So, so we can't levy a tax on developers and banks uh, to, to pay for the crisis, you know? So, so, so we're all stuck with this thing, and we can be as angry as we like, but anger is not a policy. We have to have a medium-term fiscal strategy. The government has that, and it's painful. It's been pushed ahead with. I'll come back to that in a second briefly. And secondly, we have to have some form of bank rescue package, and we have to get going with it quickly. Uh, I'm not a fan of the dynamic draft bill that's out, but it may well be possible to get suitable amendments into it and get something like that running quickly. On, on the fiscal adjustment, the older people, I see Mary Benotti in the audience, and Mary will, will remember this well, we got into a hole like this in 1978 and 1979. Uh, Charlie Mahi made a famous speech in January 1980, which has been used by one of the insurance companies in an ad recently, where he looks into the camera with all the sincerity at his command. <laughs> and, and he said, we're all living beyond our means, and we better get the finger out and do something about it. And then, of course, he, he didn't get the finger out, didn't do anything about it. And it was 10 years before we actually got on top of that problem. So, so we had a fiscal crisis, and we decided to take 10 years to sort it out the last time. Uh, and we all know uh, the damage that did. The, there is no point in hanging about. We have to get on top of it. There's a four-year time horizon. Uh, in the revised Tiberium Broad Pact. That's a very right to me. Uh, I think we have to push ahead with it. I was down in Cavan yesterday talking to the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party uh, that there may be an election, there may be a change of government. The agenda uh, facing the alternative government will not be altered by one penny. Uh, and the, 
election has to be in, in two and a half years down the start, right? I know right. Have to have say, say two and a half years' time or whatever. It might be in two and a half years' time, it might be in six months' time, who knows. But, you know, the agenda for the incoming government of whatever composition is just the same. We have to deal with both of those okay. as best we can. And you, you wouldn't support uh, David McWilliams' view that maybe you just let the whole thing collapse, let the banking system collapse and let the market sort it all out? Well, that view was expressed one evening by uh, Vincent Brown, of whom you uh, hinted you're not a fan. And somebody pointed out to Vincent that it's not as simple as letting a magazine go wallop. Yeah. With a magazine, you just don't pay the printers, you tell the staff to shag off and it's yeah. all over. It's a bit more complicated with a national banking system. And, and David McWilliams, whatever about Vincent, David McWilliams should understand that. Okay. I, I know some of you want to come back, but I just can't just that there were a number of hands being raised as well. Gentlemen here. I think you can hear me anyway, right? We can, yes. Uh, the, the, the point I would like to make here is that I, I don't think that we need to dwell, or, or I don't think we should restrict our discussion to NAMI. It's only one part of the general question about restoring trust in Ireland, Inc. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of the international perspective. I'll never forget the words that were used by the Irish Times, uh, sorry, the Financial Times, the next column in the, in the back of the Financial Times. The day after Shawnee was, Fitzpatrick was found passing the parcel, right, it was another example of cosy Irish capitalism at its worst, right? Now, just imagine that going around the world. The Financial Times doesn't have different editions in the sense that it has different language editions, but it doesn't have necessarily different columnists in each country. So that goes all around the world. Now, I don't think we were flavoured a month anyway, because the FT also covered uh, Jim Flavin and uh, the alleged insider trading, and we certainly, any of our regulator authorities, and to the best of my knowledge, I would include the Irish Stock Exchange in this, didn't exactly cover themselves in glory dealing with that. So really we have to look at dealing with people who transgress against normal commercial uh, uh, norms, if you like, right? is how we deal with them. When are we actually going to get somebody properly investigated? I'm not, make, I'm not suggesting that, for example, that Shawnee is bent. He may not be bent. He may be as innocent as the day is long. But we need to find out, and we need to find out quickly, because justice delayed is justice denied. In this case, not for the transgressor, but for perhaps all the people that he has transgressed against, which is the whole country. So we really need, that's one of the things we need to put in place, is a system that will deal speedily and quickly with allegations uh, that appear to have some kind of prima facie case against people who are basically abusing the system. Okay, Deirdre? And shifting 87 million quid around the place and, and abusing your balance sheet like that, well, it's a pretty fair, you know, it's okay. a of rest. Okay, great comment, thank you. <laughs> Deirdre? I totally agree with you. Um, I think um, anybody who, and I should say that the, that the stock exchange is not the regulator of the market and has been for quite some time, but um, having, I suppose in the earlier part of my career, been in that uh, wonderful position, um, it is incredibly difficult to bring a case um, and to, with all of the protections that are built in uh, to Irish law, um, and to do that on a timely basis. It is incredibly difficult. There are so many layers of due process um, and uh, and then the concept, and it's a constitutional concept of natural justice that has to be adhered to at every stage. So I, you know, I think we're dealing with fairly fundamental principles here that sort of go, go right across the gamut of, of, of the Irish legal system.